Hello, dearly beloved. It's Angèle here. And I would like to continue with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The last video I did was from Chapter 2, um, Everything About Jesus, the part of the Creed that says, I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. And there are seven articles. And today I will be covering, let me see if I can find it. I lost my marker. There it is. Article 2. And the title is, And in Jesus Christ, His Only Son, Our Lord. So we're at number 430. And the title is Jesus. Jesus means in Hebrew, God saves. At the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel gave him the name Jesus as his proper name, which expresses both his identity and his mission. Since God alone can forgive sins, it is God who in Jesus, his eternal Son, made man, will save his people from their sins. In Jesus, God recapitulates all of his history of salvation on behalf of men. Number 431. In the history of salvation, God was not content to deliver Israel out of the house of bondage by bringing them out of Egypt. He also saves them from their sin because sin is always an offense against God. Only he can forgive it. For this reason, Israel, becoming more and more aware of the universality of sin, will no longer be able to seek salvation except by invoking the name of the Redeemer God. 432. The name Jesus signifies that the very name of God is present in the person of his Son, made man for the universal and definitive redemption from sins. It is the divine name that alone brings salvation, and henceforth all can invoke his name, for Jesus united himself to all men through his incarnation, so that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And there really is a great power in the name of Jesus. Whenever I feel like I'm falling apart and... It's um, maybe hard to wake up in the morning. I call on the name of Jesus. Jesus, help me. And just repeat his name. Um, it's also a beautiful way to fall asleep at night, just repeating his name. It's like a lullaby. Um, we can call on the name of Jesus throughout the day. And it opens our hearts uh, more and more to his presence and gives us so much strength and truly saves, truly saves us, helps us to walk on the waters of his will. Like uh, when Jesus came to Peter walking on water and uh, at first Peter was able to walk until he felt the winds and there's the winds of maybe temptation or or difficulties, sufferings, uh, whatever uh, is going on in our lives, our stuff that that um, might trouble us. Um, so these winds he felt, and then he started to uh, take his eyes off Jesus and be preoccupied with with the difficulties, and then he started to sink, and then he said. Jesus, save me. <laughs> and Jesus did not hesitate. He immediately reached out to Peter and said, Peter, why did you lose faith? Uh, so we need to really uh, remember to call out on the name of Jesus uh, to save us, and he will be there for us immediately. Number 433, the name of the Savior God was invoked only once in the year by the high priest in atonement for the sins of Israel, after he had sprinkled the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies with a sacrificial blood. The mercy seat was the place of God's presence. When St. Paul speaks of Jesus, whom God put forward 
as an expiation by his blood. He means that in Christ's humanity, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. 434, Jesus' resurrection glorifies the name of the Savior God. For from that time on, it is the name of Jesus that fully manifests the supreme power of the name which is above every name. The evil spirits fear his name. In his name, his disciples perform miracles. For the Father grants all they ask in this name. Number 435. The name of Jesus is at the heart of Christian prayer. All liturgical prayers conclude with the words, Through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Hail Mary reaches its high point in the words, Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. The Eastern prayer of the heart, the Jesus prayer, says, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Many Christians, such as St. Joan of Arc, have died with the one word, Jesus, on their lips. What a great gift we have in the name of Jesus. There's nothing that can touch us. Uh, nothing we cannot overcome with the power of his name. How wonderful. What a great hope <laughs> we have. Uh, number two, the title is Christ. Number 436. The word Christ comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Messiah, which means anointed. It became the name proper to Jesus only because he accomplished perfectly the divine mission that Christ signifies. In effect, in Israel, those consecrated to God for a mission that he gave were anointed in his name. This was the case for kings, for priests, and in rare instances for prophets. This had to be the case all the more so for the Messiah whom God would send to inaugurate his kingdom definitively. It was necessary that the Messiah be anointed by the Spirit of the Lord as once at once as king and priest and also as prophet. Jesus fulfilled the messianic hope of Israel in his threefold office of priest, prophet, and king. Number 437. To the shepherds, the angel announced the birth of Jesus as the Messiah promised to Israel. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. From the beginning, he was the one whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, conceived as holy in Mary's virginal womb. God called Joseph to take Mary, take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, so that Jesus, who is called Christ, should be born of Joseph's spouse into the messianic lineage of David. 438. Jesus' messianic consecration reveals his divine mission, for the name Christ implies he who anointed, he who was anointed, and the very anointing with which he was anointed. The one who anointed is the Father, the one who was anointed is the Son, and he was anointed with the Spirit who is the anointing. His eternal messianic consecration was revealed during the time of his earthly life at the moment of his baptism by John when God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power that he might be revealed to Israel as its Messiah. His works and words will manifest him as the Holy One of God. 439. Many Jews and even certain Gentiles who share their hope recognized in Jesus the fundamental attributes of the Messianic Son of David promised by God to Israel. Jesus accepted his rightful title of Messiah, though with some reserve because it was understood by some of his contemporaries in too human a sense as essentially political. 440. Jesus accepted Peter's profession of faith, which acknowledged him to be the Messiah, by announcing the imminent passion of the Son of Man. He unveiled the authentic content of his messianic kingship, both in the transcendent identity of the Son of Man, who came down from heaven, and in his redemptive mission 
as the suffering servant. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Hence, the true meaning of his kingship is revealed only when he is raised high on the cross. Only after his resurrection will Peter be able to proclaim Jesus' messianic, messianic kingship to the people of God. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Uh, third section, the only Son of God. Number 441. In the Old Testament, Son of God is a title given to the angels, the chosen people, the children of Israel and their kings. It, it signifies an adoptive sonship that establishes a relationship of particular intimacy between God and his creature. When the promised Messiah king is called Son of God, it does not necessarily imply that he was more than human. According to the literal meaning of these texts, those who called Jesus Son of God as the Messiah of Israel perhaps meant nothing more than this. 4.42 Such is not the case for Simon Peter when he confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. For Jesus responds solemnly, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Similarly, Paul will write regarding his conversion on the road to Damascus, when he who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And in the synagogues immediately, Paul proclaimed Jesus saying, he is the son of God. For the beginning of from the beginning, this acknowledgement of Christ's divine sonship will be the center of the apostolic faith, first professed by Peter as the church's foundation. So we, we humbly pray that the Holy Spirit can also reveal this truth to us and give us the gift of faith to know that Jesus is truly the Christ fully God, fully man, the second person of the Holy Trinity, our Lord and our God. Um, it is a special grace given. Um, and we ask to enter that mystery more and more every day. Because we are called to know God, to know him, and by knowing him, to love him, and by loving him to serve him. But it all starts with this divine revelation, knowing him. Number 443. Peter could recognize the transcendent character of the Messiah's divine sonship because Jesus had clearly allowed it to be so understood. To his accusers question before the Sanhedrin, Are you the Son of God then? Jesus answered, You say that I am. Well before this, Jesus referred to himself as the Son, who knows the Father, as distinct from the servants. God had earlier sent to his people, he is superior even to the angels. He distinguished his sonship from that of his disciples by never saying our Father, except to command them. You then pray like this, our Father. And he emphasized this distinction saying, my father and your father. Number 444. The Gospels report that at two solemn moments, the baptism and the transfiguration of Christ, the voice of the Father de designates Jesus his beloved Son. Jesus calls himself the only Son of God, and by this title affirms his eternal pre existence. He asks for faith in the name of the only Son of God. In the centurion's exclamation before the crucified Christ, truly this man was the Son of God, that Christian confession is already heard. Only in the Paschal mystery can the believer give the title, Son of God, 
its full meaning. Number 445. After this, his resurrection, Jesus' divine sonship becomes manifest in the power of his glorified humanity. He was designated Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. The apostles can confess we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Number 446. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the ineffable Hebrew name YHWH, by which God revealed himself to Moses, is rendered as Kyrios, Lord. From then on, Lord becomes the more usual name by which to indicate the divinity of Israel's God. The New Testament uses this full sense of the title Lord, both for the Father and what is new for Jesus, who is thereby recognized as God himself. Number 447. Jesus ascribes this title to himself in a veiled way when he disputes with the Pharisees about the meaning of Psalm 110, but also in an explicit way when he addresses his apostles. Throughout his public life, he demonstrated his divine sovereignty by works of power over nature, illnesses, demons, death, and sin. So Jesus didn't only say that he is fully God, he proved it by the miracles that he worked. Because only God can perform miracles. A miracle is something that is um, supernatural. And we know that the devil can work signs and wonders, but they don't last. And the miracles that God performs are lasting. So this is how we know that Jesus is truly God, also by the, the power he has over nature, over illnesses, demons, death, and sin. Number 448. Very often in the Gospels, people address Jesus as Lord. This title testifies to the respect and trust of those who approach him for help and healing. At the prompting of the Holy Spirit, Lord expresses the recognition of the divine mystery of Jesus. In the encounter with the risen Jesus, this title becomes adoration, my Lord and my God. It thus takes on a connotation of love and affection that remains proper to the Christian tradition. It is the Lord. Number 449. By attributing to Jesus the divine title, Lord, the first confessions of the church's faith affirm from the beginning that the power, honor, and glory due to God the Father are due also to Jesus because he was in the form of God. And the Father manifested the sovereignty of Jesus by raising him from the dead and exalting him into his glory. Number 450. From the beginning of Christian history, the assertion of Christ's lordship over the world and over history has implicitly recognized that man should not submit his personal freedom in an absolute manner to any earthly power, but only to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Caesar is not the Lord. The church believes that the key, the center, and the purpose of the whole of man's history is to be found in its Lord and Master. Our freedom is sacred. And Jesus wants us to be free. And we are only 
um, to be fully uh, surrendered and submitted to God. And the beauty about uh, this trust that we put in God is that he gives us our true freedom. The freedom to choose what is good. And no one has the right to take away our freedom. Our freedom to choose. It's very important um, to embrace this, uh, this message from God himself, Jesus. It's, it's a, a central, central thing that has always been taught in Christianity is that our freedom is holy, is sacred. It, it, it reveals to us our dignity as children, as children of God. Number 451, Christian prayer is characterized by the title, Lord, whether in the invitation to prayer, the Lord be with you, its conclusion, through Christ our Lord, or the exclamation full of trust and hope, Maranatha, our Lord, come. Or Maranatha, come, Lord. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And we feel that in these times uh, that we're living in, our freedom is being taken away from us step by step. And it's important to call on Jesus and ask him to come. Come, Lord Jesus, be our strength, be our freedom. Help us to always choose what is pleasing to you. Just as our Blessed Mother Mary was always blessed with the grace and freedom to choose what is holy and good and to reject what is sinful and evil. And we've all been given the gift of a conscience. And when we stay close to Jesus and his sacraments, then our conscience is awakened to truly know what is evil and what is good in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we ask Jesus to come and be near us in these times so that we might always truly know what is pleasing to him and have the courage to choose what is good and what is right and just. Let us trust in Jesus through Mary with Joseph. May God bless all of you.